Um, so hey guys, welcome back to our advanced lectures. Uh, this week we are going to be talking about backtracking. So this is um, a little bit different than uh, the other topics we've talked about so far, because this is like, it's really only going to show up uh, at ICPC and only at our specific region, pretty much. Um, this is a very specific problem type um, that most contests are not going to have, but uh, our regional every year will typically have one or two of these problems. Um, and the implementation can be very hard if you're just going into it blind. So we're going to, to basically go over the template that we use for these problems, which makes the, solving them much quicker. Um, I, I will say that being getting good at implementing these problems is good outside of CP and very useful. Yeah. So that's definitely. one reason you should care. Mm. So basically, these problems are like variations on Sudoku. Um, and you, the solution is essentially brute force, but you want to optimize that brute force as much as you can. Um, so we'll go over how to do that. Yeah, so basically the plan is uh, we're going to go over a template we have. Uh, um, for anyone interested in ICPC for this year, we still don't know when that's going to be or any of the details for that. Um, but I recommend you guys either uh, learn how to use this template or uh, try to modify it for it yourself. OK, uh, so a couple of quick things before we get into it. Um, so this is definitely a problem where you want to use C or C++ as opposed to Java, if possible, uh, because it can save you a factor of two in terms of uh, time. Um, which generally doesn't matter for most CP problems, but for something like this, that's really going to matter. Like it, it, these, the time complexity usually gets very down to the wire here, so any factor of two is helpful. And for the same reason, um, even though we usually say use long longs everywhere, never use ints, uh, we're going to use ints here just because they're half the size of long longs. So that is another factor of two we're gaining. Um, and then also. There's this header, um, which we talked about in our C++ lecture a couple of weeks ago. Um, this we have in our normal template, too. It's just going to generally speed everything up. So basically, uh, we're doing everything we can to make this as fast as possible. OK. Yeah, so first we're going to talk about solving Sudoku, and then we'll sort of branch off and into how to solve a more general type of problem. All right, so here's our problem statement. Um, you're given partially filled Sudoku, and you want to solve it, essentially. So every row, every column, and every one of these three by three boxes um, should have every number from one through nine. OK. So the idea of the solution is we're going to Traverse the grid, uh, starting from the top left and going to the bottom right. And we're going to go row by row, right? Um, so as we're traversing through the grid row by row, at every empty square we hit, we're going to try to put every number from 1 through 9 into this square. Um, so every time we put a number into the square, we're going to check if this causes a contradiction. So like if there's another number in the same row, or the same column or the same box. Um, and if there is, then we skip that number, right? Because that can't be part of the solution. Uh, otherwise, if that number works, we're going to put that number there and then move on to the next square. And if we get to the end, if we try all nine numbers and none of them work, then we're going to go back to the previous square um, and sort of try the next number for the previous square. So this is probably going to be a little bit easier to think about uh, once I show you guys the pseudocode. Uh, but does anyone have any questions about the general solution here? OK. Yeah, this lecture is going to be um, a lot more of just me talking than a lot of these lectures, because it's hard to do sample problems for this. So if you guys have questions, uh, really speak up, because I guarantee you uh, everyone else is going to have the same question. OK. 
So yeah, the pseudocode for this is going to look like this. So we're going to do this recursively, where btrc is going to backtrack us starting from row r, column c. OK, so if we've gone past the last square, right? so if rc is like outside the bounds of the grid, um, then we return true. right? Because that's like our end condition. This is after we've gone through every square with no contradictions. So this is going to return true because we have found a solution. Um, if the value at RC is non-zero, then that means that we're at a position like this, where it has a value already here. So we don't get to decide what this value is. So that means we just basically skip over this square and we backtrack from the next row, next column. Um, next or next C is basically the next position as you're traversing row by row. So for most squares, you can think about it as the square directly to the right. Okay, so we're basically skipping this square, go to the square directly to the right. Um, otherwise, then we know that we are at a position where we can put any number. So iterate for, uh, for x from 1 through 9. And if we can put x in position r, r c, um, so if this doesn't cause any contradictions, then we put x in position rc. And we're going to try to backtrack from the next square. Right, so if we can find a solution starting from the next square, then um, that means we have a solution with x in position rc, so we can just return true. Otherwise, we're going to remove x from position rc and move on to the next value of x. OK, and if we ever get past x equals 9 and we never return true, then we return false. Because that means everything in the squares before RC caused a contradiction, and now no values work in that square. OK, um, questions on this? OK, so this is just sort of the brief pseudocode overview of what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to get into how to actually do all these operations now, because like this is a very sort of abstract thing. OK, um, so the way we're going to check if we can put x in position rc is by using bit masks. Um, so we're going to store a bit mask for every row, column, and box, where we set the i minus 1th bit if we can put i in that box. So we're going to initialize all the masks to 2 to the ninth minus 1, which in binary is just a series of nine ones. Um, and each of these bits is going to indicate whether we can put that value in this row or this column or whatever. So if we're looking at this square here, right, um, the bit mask for the row would look like this, because you can put everything except for 3, 5, and 8 in this row, right? because it already has a 3, 5, and 8. Then if we look at the column, um, you can put everything except a 1, a 2, and a 4 in this column. And for the square, you can put everything except for a 2 or a 3 in the square. So given these three bit masks, um, so what we could do if we wanted to determine if we can put a value in this square is we could check each of these three bit masks separately. Um, but what is sort of a cleaner way that we can get like a more condensed version of everything you can put in this square? I don't know if that was phrased very well as a question, but basically given these three bit, yeah, exactly. Um, so you want to take the bitwise and of these three masks, right? Because if you take the and of these three masks, um, the only bits that are going to be set are the bits that are set in all three. So in this case, that would be 9, 7, 6. I think that's it. I think it would just be 9, 7, 6. Yeah. So you take the a bitwise and to get the mask of stuff you can put in here. Um, and then, so if we want to update these masks, Notice that all we have to do is XOR the mask with one shifted to the X minus one. 
right? So if we want to add x to a square or remove x from a square, um, it's the same operation, right? Because it's doing the XOR. Um, because if it's already in the mask, it'll take it out. If it's out, it'll put it back in. Um, so to add or remove, all we have to do is these three XOR operations, where R mask is the bit mask for the rows, C mask is the bit mask for the columns, and SQ mask is the bit mask for the squares, where we define this SQ macro that basically gives you the square number um, as a function of R and C. Right, so SQRC is just going to look like this. It basically just gives you an index of the square for each position. All right, does this make sense? Cool. Yeah, so our code is now going to basically look like this. So this BT function uh, is essentially what we had before, except we've turned the pseudocode into actual code. Um, so if the way we're doing this is we're zero indexing. So um, our valid values are going to be zero through eight for rows and columns. So if we ever get to row nine, that means we're past the end. Uh, so we can return true because we're sort of out of bounds there. Um, we're then going to define ri and ci, which is basically the next square you're going to go to. So like I said, that's usually just going to be the square directly to your right. But if you're at the end of a row, that's going to be the first square in the next row. Um, so you don't really have to worry too much about what's happening here. The column is just increasing by one mod at nine, and the row is increasing if the column is at the end, essentially. But you can just think of RICI as the next square in our ordering. Wouldn't RI just be easy to write R plus C equals eight? Um, probably. Yeah, that, that would work too. I usually don't trust the whole Boolean equals zero or one thing, even though I know it works. But yeah, that, that would be shorter. Um, yeah, so you could also do that. Uh, so then here, so if grid RC, so grid RC is just representing the current state of the board. Um, so if grid RC is non-zero, again, that means we have an already set value there. So we skip over it, go to RICI. Um, we take the bitwise and of the three masks we care about here. Um, and then we iterate over x values. If um, the x minus one bit is set in the bit mask, uh, this is the same as if you did mask and one shifted to the x minus one. Um, so if the x minus one bit is set in the bit mask, that means we can put x here. So in that case, we're going to do our add function. We're going to add x. If there's a solution starting from the next square, we can return true. Otherwise, we're going to remove x. And then we return false. Um, this is a nice trick. Uh, we could just do x less than or equal to 9, but this will stop as soon as there are no more set bits in the bit mask. So like if 9, 8, and 7 are all 0 in the bit mask, then this will stop after you hit 6. So this is just saving you a little bit of time. Um, and then, yeah, so this is our add function, where add rcx1 is going to add a value of x at position rc, and add rcx minus 1 is going to remove a value of x at rc. So all that's going to do is set the grid value to either x or 0, and then do these three xor operations we were talking about. Questions on the code? Okay. Just another uh, golfing idea. Sorry, probably shouldn't be yeah. too much. But like, can you not zor the grid value with x depending on s? Um, like a uh, grid zor oh, equals like x just, times s. If you just make s one and zero, just do x times s, and then... I think you could just zor equals x. I think that would work because you're setting it to either x or zero. Right, because in, in in this code at least you're using it to do always remove add comes after remove. Like properly, but so I guess you can just get rid of s and then just do grid rc or equals x. Yeah. So when we get into the more general template, we are going to need to use s for more things. Yeah, so that's. Um, but it, it, yeah, in this case, yeah, you can just do grid rc or equals x. I'm gonna actually change the template to do that because that's nice. Okay. Um, but yeah, s is gonna matter more in a bit. Okay.
yeah, so then when we want to set everything up before the backtracking, um, this is a really nice macro specifically for backtracking. Um, some of you guys have probably seen the FILR version that we normally use. Um, this just comes up a lot more often in the template. So this is what I usually use here. Um, it's basically just a for loop for i from zero less than k. So um, we're going to fill, oh, I haven't explained what Matt. Ignore this. This should just be row mask, column mask, square mask. We haven't explained what this is yet. But basically, fill all your bit masks with 511, which is the nine ones thing we talked about. Um, and then when you're reading your input, um, so you read in the input for each square. If the input is non-zero, we're going to just do an add call to add, add x at position rc in the same way that you would in the backtracking. Um, we're just adding in the given value because it does the same things to the bit masks. Uh, and then so output and the main method. So I like doing the output with a macro where you just have d defined as this whole thing which basically just prints out the grid. And then your main method will just be um, init, which is this function here, then backtrack from position zero, zero, and then display. All right, because BT zero, zero will fill the whole grid with a solution that works, assuming that there is one. And the reason I like using the D macro to output, right? rather than put it in the main method, is it makes debugging really nice. Um, because one thing that is often very helpful when doing these problems is printing out like the first few iterations of backtracking um, to see like where you're getting errors. Because it's this is not the kind of code that usually works on the first try. So you're usually going to need to do something like this, where at the top of your backtrack function, uh, you have some like global counter. And if the counter is less than 10, uh, you just display and print out a new line. So this will give you like the first few steps you're backtracking, and you can see where you're sort of going wrong um, if you're getting any weird answers. Uh, sort of fo uh, following along on the, you'll, always, you'll get a bunch of errors in the first times you write it. Um, that's very true, and you'll also get a bunch of sec faults, usually. So use the uh, address sanitizer and all those uh, things if you, if you have those available to you in your build command when you're compiling, because that saves you so much time as opposed to searching for seg faults yourself. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about how to generalize this template beyond Sudoku for like more general problems. So um, here are the variables we're going to use uh, with the values that we had in Sudoku as like constants. So uh, n and m is going to be the dimensions of the grid. n is number of rows. m is number of columns. So that's 9 by 9 in Sudoku. Uh, DFV is your default value. This will usually be given in the input format, um, which we had as 0 in Sudoku, right? Because 0 meant empty. Um, min value, max value are the min and max values you can put in your uh, squares. We're assuming that that's a continuous range. Uh, because in these problems, it usually is. Um, and then m is the number of masks for each square. right? So for each square, you have a row mask, you have a column mask, and you have a square mask. By square mask, I mean like three by three box. So there's three masks per square, which is m. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of generalize the bit mask structure we have. Um, so rather than having three separate um, arrays, one for rows, one for columns, one for squares. We're going to have one 2D array um, that's basically just combining all, all those arrays, right? So mask zero is just our row bit masks. Mask one is our column bit masks. And mask two is our square bit masks. So that's all we're doing is we're taking those three arrays and we're shoving them into one like three by whatever array. Um, and one other thing we need to add to make this work is we're going to add this MT macro, which is like the mask type. Um, so if i equals 0, basically this is given a square and the index of the mask we want, we want to know what this second value should be. right? So if we want 
the zero mask of square RC, that's going to be the rth position because we want the row mask of R. If I equals one, then we want C because we want the column mask. And then if I equals two, we want the square. So sort of the idea is you want to be able to do mask I, MT, RC, I to get the mask you want. This is probably a bit confusing, but it just sort of lets you condense all your bit masks into one array and have more of a general structure. Questions on this? Okay. And notice that we're going to have um, m of these values, right? Because m is the number of masks per square. Um, so like here, you have the three masks per square. Um, so we have the 0, 1, 2, look up to 3, basically. OK. Yeah, so using this new bit mask structure, um, we basically just get to turn this add function into a for loop, right? where instead of having the three separate XORs, we just do a for loop. Um, and then we can do this. And it, it does the same thing. Um, the one thing we're not going to change is this. Um, so this is still, we're not doing a for loop here to get the end, uh, just because that would make the code longer. Um, but if you do change what the masks mean, you will usually have to change this line. But again, this is just doing the same thing where um, we get the end of all the masks for a square. OK, and then everything else is basically the same. Um, you can see that we made some minor adjustments to the code, mostly getting rid of constants. So instead of r equals 9, now it's r equals n. Um, instead of using uh, 9 here, we're using m, the number of columns. Um, instead of using 1, we're using min value. Um, all we've really done here is swap out constants, besides changing the masks a bit. OK. And the other thing we want to do is add uh, these sort of local checks. So for some problems, you're not, you're going to have like conditions you need to meet that aren't just bit masks, right? Because like the only conditions on a Sudoku grid are like bit mask conditions. Like you can't have two duplicate values in a row or a column or whatever. But some problems, in fact, most problems are going to have more than that. Um, like other conditions you need to check. So we added in this locally valid function um, where basically you check all the other conditions. So whenever you're using this, you would have to implement this to basically catch whatever other conditions you need to check. OK, and the only way this is going to change the code is we're going to basically add it before these two statements so that if it's not locally valid, we're not going to backtrack to the next one. OK. Yeah, so that is sort of the more general template. Um, so now we're going to talk about how to apply this to a problem. So this was an ICPC problem, I think, 2017. Um, so you're given an n by m grid where n and m are less than or equal to 7. Um, where the squares are partitioned into these pieces. And if a piece is of size k, it has to contain the numbers from 1 to k. Um, and no two equal numbers can touch, even diagonally. So notice that we don't have any row or column bit mask restrictions, right? Because you can have as many ones in this row as you want. Um, the only restrictions we have are no two equal numbers can touch, even diagonally. And every piece of size k has to contain the numbers from 1 to k. So like this piece is size five. So you'll notice that it has the numbers one through five. Okay. So setting up the bit masks. So we're going to make this array PRC, which gives us what piece position RC is in, right? So like this might have PRC of zero, then one, one, two, 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 two. two. PRC is just, an indicator for what square you're in. Um, we only have one bit mask per square, right? Because the only bit mask we care about here is for the piece. 
So that means we have m equals one um, and m or mtrci is just prc. So we can update the code in bt where the mask for the square is just mask zero prc. Uh, uh, is, is there a reason you didn't do it like you have also have one more mask centered at every square for like the, the eight neighboring guys and you update your eight neighboring guys whenever you change something? Just get on one of your you could, input onto uh, I, I feel like that would add a lot of casework and a lot of code. Um, that's like the kind of condition that seems easier to handle in LV. Okay. Um, I, yeah, because you'd have to worry about like if you're on the top row, like you don't go above or whatever. Um, but if you're doing it in here, uh, you can do it with sort of like a double for loop. Um, so basically what we're doing here for LVRC is we're making sure that the value at RC is not the same as any of its neighbors, even diagonally. So we're adding in this macro to determine um, whether RC is within the bounds of the grid. Right, so it's, it's just checking that um, R is not negative or bigger than N, same sort of thing with that, C. Um, yeah, so then what we're doing is iterate over dr from negative one to one, dc from negative one to one. Um, and that's going to give you every square in the three by three square centered at rc. Right, and we want to check every square except rc itself. So we don't want to check when dr is zero and dc is zero. Um, so in that case, that's why we have this check here. Um, so if dr and dc are both zero, this will be false, so we don't do the if statement here. Um, yeah, so basically if r plus dr, c plus dc is a valid square, and it's not rc itself, and the values are equal in r plus dr, c plus dc, and rc, then we return false, because we found a square next to rc that has the same value. Um, otherwise, we can return true. So again, the basic idea behind this is we want to use this for checking the conditions um, that would be more annoying to check with bit masks or that you can't check with bit masks, essentially. Questions on this? And I mean, the reason we call this local is it, it can affect like a huge amount of the grid. Like, like this is affecting like nine squares, but sort of the idea is you want to do this for like smaller updates that aren't going to be as time consuming. Um, even though in a lot of cases you can do some like big stuff in here. Okay. And then initializing values. So the input format for this problem is horrible. Uh, so we're not going to go over it here. Um, setting up, like reading the input format um, can often be one of the worst parts of these problems. Um, and initializing stuff can be really annoying, um, but it's usually not something that has too many bugs in it. But like in general, um, updating init and locally valid is gonna take up most of your time solving these problems because most of everything else uh, is gonna generalize very well. So you're not going to need to change it much. But input format is always a problem with these. OK. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about sort of a similar but slightly different problem, uh, which is when you have some constraints. So we want to be able to handle a third kind of constraint um, besides the bit mass constraints we had and the small local checks. Um, like, for example, every row or column must add up to a given sum. So, like, let's say you had this problem, where you have to fill an 8 byte grid with the numbers 1 through 5, uh, some of the values are given, and you know that every row has to add up to some value. Uh, you're given an array of all the values it has to add up to. And every column has to add up to a, a given value. Again, you have an array for that. 
Um, and again, you, you just have to solve the grid essentially. So no bit mass constraints. You can have any numbers that are equal next to each other in the same row, anything like that. Okay. So the idea of our solution is um, we're going to use the similar BT structure, right? So we're doing the same thing where we loop through square by square, um, try out all the values, and if they work, we move on. If not, we move on to the next one, right? Um, so basically, we want a nice way of checking if we can put a value x in position RC um, in the same way that we have a nice condition for Sudoku, where you just check if you take the end of the bit masks and you check if that bit is set. So we want like a nice condition for that too, for the sum things. Um, so the way we're going to do that is store the remaining sum that you need in each row or column, as well as the number of empty spaces left in that row or column. So let's say for a given row, you know how many empty squares you have left and what the remaining sum you need is. How can you determine the minimum and maximum value you can put in one of those empty squares? So like, let's say you have a row where the empty squares have to add up to 15 um, and you have like three empty squares. How do you determine the min and max values that can go in an empty square? And again, you know that the values in the squares have to be in some range, um, like one to whatever. I think it was one to five. Well, a Sudoku, the largest number is nine, and you know those three squares add up to less than that. You know it can't be, none of those squares can be greater than nine, or less, it would be two minus, because there's three squares. Or three minus, because one has to be two, one has to be two. Yeah, well, so again, remember in this problem, um, we don't care about equal values at all now. Um, you can have as many copies of the same number in a row as you want. Um, the only thing we care about is the sum and the values are all within some range. Uh, but yeah, that's the right idea is if you want to uh, maximize the number in one of the squares, you want to minimize the numbers in all the other empty squares and vice versa if you want the minimum value. So let's say a row has k empty squares. Um, if we want to know the minimum element we can put there, see what happens if you put the maximum element in the other k minus 1 empty squares. So let's say this is your row. Um, so you need 11 sum. You need these three to add up to 11. And you have three empty squares left. Um, if you want to know what the minimum value you can get in here is, try putting the maximum values here. So try putting fives here and see what that leaves you with. And you can get that by subtracting um, 2 times 5 from 11. And then you get a value of 1. And if you want the max value, um, you can subtract the min value uh, from these two and see what you get here. And that would be 9. So notice that this max value is bigger than the actual max value we can have. Um, so you do have to take the min of this with 5, which is our actual max value in this problem. Um, but yeah, so th that's how you can do it is basically just subtract either the max or the min times empty minus one from the sum. And that gives you the contiguous range of um, values you can put in this square. Okay. So do you do separately for rows and columns? Yes. And then you take, uh, you take the maximum min value and the minimum max value. Because again, you're, you're kind of intersecting the ranges, right? 
Um, so that leaves you with a contiguous range of values you can take on, potentially empty. Um, and one quick note about this is if there's only one empty square left, the min and max values that we're going to accept are both going to be exactly the required sum, right? Because if there's only one empty square left, empty minus one is just zero. So the min and max values we get are both the sum. Um, so this forces you to put in a value that gets you to the correct sum if you're in the last square in a row. Uh, so we don't need to do any other checks to make sure we have the right sum at the end. Uh, as long as we make, as long as we like keep this condition accurate at every step, then we're good. Okay. Yeah, so here's the code for finding the min and the max values. So for the min, um, again, we're taking the max of the sort of three minimum bounds we have. So one is, um, it has to be at least the minimum possible value, right? Then one is the minimum value we get from the row, which is this. Um, and one is the minimum value we get for the column. We're taking the max over these three values. And then same thing for the max, uh, except we're taking the min over those three boundaries we have. All right. Um, so here, our sum is um, the remaining sum in the row. C sum is the remaining sum in the column. R empt is a uh, number of empty squares in the row. C empt is number of empty squares in the column. Questions? Okay. So here's what add and backtrack are going to look like. So these are basically the same functions uh, we had before, um, except we're changing how we're doing the conditions, right? We're not doing any of the bit mask stuff anymore. We just need to maintain the sums and the empty values, essentially. Um, yeah. So. For uh, add, for backtrack, um, this part's all the same. Um, here we're going to get the minimum value we can put and the maximum value we can put. And then iterate for x from the min value less than or equal to the max value. And then this is all the same. Um, and then in add, the changes are we have to maintain the sums and the empty. Um, so to uh, update the sum, we want to subtract s times x, right? So if s is one, if we're adding something in that position, we want to subtract from the remaining sum, right? But then if we're removing, we want to add back to the remaining sum. So we're basically doing minus equals s times x for our sum. And for the same reason, we're going to do minus equals x for the number of empties, right? Because if you're adding a square to a row, you're decreasing number of empties by one. If you're removing it, you're increasing number of empties by one. Any questions on this? Okay. So now, uh, just like we did for Sudoku, we're going to generalize this code. Um, and again, just like there, the first thing we're going to do is uh, turn our sum arrays and our empty arrays and basically smash them all into a 2D array in the same way. So S and ST are going to basically be the same as M and MT, but for sums instead of masks. So S is the number of types of sums we have to deal with. So um, for this problem, S is 2 because you have row sums and you have column sums. And then ST is going to do the same thing. Basically, it's going to take in I and then give you the I th sum parameter um, at position RC. So here, if you want like the sum of type 0, that's just the row. And the sum of type 1 is just the column. So again, we basically turned R sums R into this and C sums C into this. Okay. So get min and get max are now going to look like this. Um, 
so there's more code here than there was before um, because generalizing it, I, to generalize it, you have to kind of um, add a little bit more structure. Seems like um, this can be made into a macro, no? Because the only things you're switching are the letter N and X and then the word min or max. Yeah, so the next slide is basically how do we turn oh. these two into one function? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so basically what we have here is, is we're just doing what we did before where you take the max over all the constraints and here you take the min over all the constraints. Um, but again, there's a lot of redundancy between these two, right? Because like look, uh, like Akif was saying, all you're doing is you're changing the ends and the x's and like the min to the max. Uh, so we can do some like nice reductions here and like smash into one function. Um, and that turns into this. Um, so we do still have to deal with like max versus min here. So it doesn't go down like all the way to like the size of one of these, but you are still saving a decent amount of code. Um, so you don't really have to worry too much about what this is doing. Basically, it's just combining the functions of these two by adding in a third Boolean parameter. So get x rc true is going to return the min, and rc false is going to return the max. OK. And then our generalized add is going to basically look like this. So for each of our sum types, we're going to subtract s times x. For each of our empty types, we're going to subtract s. So it's the same thing we had before, except we've changed out the, math, the sums and the empties to be the more generalized forms. OK. Yeah, so now the uh, last thing we're going to talk about is how to combine these templates. So we have the template for all the bitmask stuff, and we have the template for all the sum stuff. Um, usually, you're only going to need one or the other. Um, but there is a lot of redundancy between them. It's a lot of the same code. Um, so you can combine them into one template. And it is possible, though I don't think it's happened at uh, GeneWire yet, that you'll have a problem where you need the sum constraints and the bitmask constraints. Um, so it's nice to have them sort of in one template, even though you'll really only have to type up one half or the other most times. OK. So here are all the macros and global variables we have. Um, so this is a lot. Uh, um, we've kind of built these up over the course of the lecture. Um, so we have the for loop macro. We have the print macro. Um, this is checking if you're inbound, which is a very common thing that will show up when you're doing like the locally valid checks. Um, we have the square macro um, because a lot of these problems are Sudoku. Um, so they will have the structure of like the rows, the columns, the three by three box. Uh, so having this macro around is nice. Um, we have MTST, which gives you the mask type and the sum type. Um, I have these default values in here. You'll probably have to change those. Um, you want n to be some big value. Usually, I like to make n at least the number of squares in the grid, even though you probably could get away with n as just the number of rows or columns, um, because some of these arrays might get pretty big. Um, like in the capsules problem, if you have every square in its own capsule, you might have um, like n squared different bit masks. So usually, if you just make this 100, it's fine, because typically, you're not going to have more than 100 squares in your grid. Um, yeah, and then m is number of mask types, and s is number of sum types. Uh, once again, n by m is the dimensions of the grid. dfv is the default value, like the empty value. Um, SMV is the sum value, like what you need everything to add up to. Um, a lot of times, even if you have some constraints, you won't need this. Sorry, and then I MNV. What do you mean by S is that? You mean like like? Sorry, is some that problems, per thing. I don't yeah, understand what that's. Some doing. some problems will have like a global sum, like every row is to add up to fifteen. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. Um, so yeah, SMV. Um, it doesn't. It's not used as much as the other ones. Um, but if you have a global sum constraint, that's what you would use. 
And so you're saying this is every row individually or has to add up to this or something, not the whole. Yeah, time. like uh, there was one I think where you have to have every row and every column add up to ten. Gotcha. So you would have ten as your SMV. It's like your okay, okay. global something. Um, okay. And then MNV MXV is just max min and max values you can put in a square. So then the arrays we have here are the grid. So this is the actual like values. Um, you have the bit masks the empty counts, and the sums. All right, questions on this? OK. Uh, here are all the sort of smaller helper functions. So we have uh, locally valid, which you're always just going to have to implement based on the problem, um, because those constraints are always very specific. Um, add is. Uh, basically just the two add functions we had before. So we change the value grid RC, um, then we change the sum constraints, then we change the bit mask constraints. So this is basically just the two add functions we had before, but combined into one. And then uh, this is the same exact function we had in the last section, where it'll give you the min and max value you can put in the square based on the sum constraints. Okay. Questions on this? Um, so these two are not functions you're going to have to change like ever. Um, this is one you'll obviously have to like fully implement for each problem. But these two you generally don't have to touch. Um, backtrack. Um, like add, we've basically just taken the two constraints we had before and uh, put them both in one function. So you're going to get the bit mask um, for the square, so and all the necessary masks together. You will probably have to update this one line, um, although the rest of this function should be, should be the same for every problem. Um, then you get the min value, get the max value. Um, and then as you're iterating through x, you have to make sure that x is in between min x and max x. and um, we have this constraint from before where there's at least one one um, at a value x or greater. And then you have to check that um, the value for x is set in the mask. Then um, this part is all the same as before. So basically, these three lines, we're basically checking the sum constraints and the bit mask constraints, as opposed to just one or the other. And then init and main are going to look like this. So init, you're probably going to have to throw out most of this code and um, rewrite a lot out of it, because the setup is very different for most of these problems. Um, but here, we're filling the bit masks with um, one shifted to basically the number of valid values we have. So this would be 9 for Sudoku, right? Because 9 minus 1 plus 1. Um, so this basically just gives you uh, a bunch of bits in a row um, where the number of those bits is the number of values you can have. Um, then we're going to fill each of our empty values with n. Again, this is probably not going to be true unless n equals m. Um, you're going to fill your sums with some value. Again, this is also generally not going to be true. Um, reading in the board is usually going to be very similar. Um, so you read in your numbers. If they're not the default value, then you add them, essentially. Um, a couple things to be careful about. You might have to do multiple test cases, um, in which case you would have to reset the board and reset everything. Uh, and you also might need to check if the input is consistent. Uh, so like they, I haven't seen this in any problems, because um, usually they guarantee that there is a solution. Um, but I mean, I guess it is technically possible that they give you a problem where initially there are like two ones in the same row, right? Like before you put any values in. And that's something you would need to catch here um, before you do anything, right? Because um, after that, your masks aren't going to detect it. Um, or you probably get some weird undefined behavior. I'm not sure what exactly would happen. 
Um, again, this isn't something that I've ever seen in a problem, but if they don't guarantee that there's a solution, that's something to think about. And then in the same vein, um, if you're not guaranteed to have a solution, then you need to check if this returns false. Because if this returns false, then there's no solution. Again, it's not usually something you have to worry about. Questions on this? Okay. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Um, as always, these slides are in the link to the folder. There's a link to the folder with the slides of Discord. Um, and also, I have put up a contest on the Code Forces group with nine of these problems um, if any of you guys are interested in practicing. So for anyone interested in ICPC, whenever that ends up happening, this will definitely be good practice. Although, um, admittedly, solving these problems uh, can be like very annoying and tedious at the beginning. Um, if you get in the practice, you can get uh, very fast at solving them. And also, I have a link to the template um, if you guys are interested in that. So yeah, um, next week is going to be uh, kind of a related topic in that it's something that is mostly going to show up at ICPC at our regional um, because they have a very distinctive style of geometry problems. And like backtracking, it can be hard to deal with that without a good template. Um, so we're going to go over a geometry template. Um, but we're also going to do a lot more problem solving than we were able to do today. Um, because with the geometry problems, um, the template is a big part of it, but there is also a lot of problem solving that goes into that. So we'll be able to do a lot more of like our usual lecture stuff uh, where we give sample problems and you guys can try them out. So I highly recommend you guys come next week. So yeah, thank you guys for coming.